Today, we are going to wrap up this talk and series of talks we've been having on the topic of health. And, uh, and, and this talk I'm titling, Pearls, Pigs, and the Power of Tribe. Everyone say that with me. Pearls, Pigs, and the Power of Tribe. If you're taking notes on paper or in the Canvas app, that'll be there as well as the scriptures that we're going to walk through today. I want to sort of frame the teaching today by looking at a very obscure, bizarre command of Jesus. Likely you've read it and you thought to yourself, that's weird. Maybe even laughed when you read it because it's so bizarre. And it's in Matthew chapter 7, verse 6, and Jesus is teaching and he says this. He says, don't waste what is holy on people who are unholy. And then he says this, don't throw your pearls to pigs. Let's read that line out loud together. Don't throw your pearls to pigs. They will trample the pearls, then turn and attack you. Jenna, can I get this real quick? I wonder how many of you um, have heard this verse before, or maybe you're hearing it for the first time today, and you're thinking to yourself, huh, that's strange. What is Jesus even talking about? You know, don't throw your pearls to pigs. Here you go, piggy. Here you go, piggy. Piggy, want some pearls? Don't throw. See, what's funny about this verse, the problem with this verse, is that likely none of you were tempted to do this in the first place. Right? None of you were like, what should we do after church today? I know. Let's find some pigs and throw some pearls at it. Don't throw your pearls to pigs. What in the world is even going on here? Now, if you're going to be a good student of the Bible, an important thing to know is that when you read one verse, it's very important to read the verses that come before it and after it as well. To understand what in the world is going on. And this case is no exception. You see, you need to zoom back and understand that Jesus is in the midst of a series of teachings. And in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus is talking about surrendering yourself to God. But if you zoom out even more to Matthew 5 and through chapter 7, you realize that Jesus is in the midst of a collection of teachings called the Sermon on the Mount. And the Sermon on the Mount is a collection of teachings from Jesus where he sort of explains what it looks like to be human in his world. And you should understand that there's this parallel between Jesus and Moses going on, right? Because God gave Moses the Ten Commandments on a mountain. Moses brought those commandments to the nation of Israel to show them how to be a nation for the glory of God. Well, Jesus is now posturing himself as sort of a new Moses, a better Moses, and every Jew would have picked up on this, that he's on a mountain bringing new commands, and it's not just for a nation, it's for the world. And he's teaching them through the Sermon on the Mount a new way to be human. And so in chapter 6, Jesus teaches on surrendering yourself to God so that you're not an anxious presence in the world. I don't know about you, but has anyone in this room ever been anxious about life? Have you ever been worried about what's going to happen in your future? If you didn't raise your hand, you're just lying, and that's okay. We forgive you. Because... All of us, if you're a human being, have had moments in your life where you're anxious, where you're worried about what's going to happen next. You're worried and anxious about your future. And Jesus in Matthew 6, he ends it by teaching us on what it looks like to not be an anxious presence in the world. And he invites us into this new humanity where we live with a bigger perspective. And Jesus does this through this word picture of how God takes care of the birds. And he's like, you don't see the birds worrying about what they're e going to eat and where they're going to sleep, which is kind of funny, but it's true, right? I have yet to ever see a bird flying through the sky. What will I eat today? Like, I've never seen a bird worried about where it's going to sleep. And in a comical sort of way, Jesus is saying, hey, I love you more than, I love, than, the, than the birds. And so if the birds are taken care of by God, then you should know that you will be taken care of as well. And so Jesus teaches us that a new way to be human is to surrender ourselves to the love and providence and provision of this divine and good God. 
See, something that you should know in this room, especially if you're new to church or new to faith or you rejected faith and you're thinking about returning to it because, I don't know, maybe you still just feel there's something to it. You should know that what the picture Jesus paints of God is that God is so great that he can meet your needs, but it doesn't end there. He's also so good that he wants to meet your needs. He wants to meet you where you are. And so Jesus says, how do we enter into this new humanity at the end of Matthew 6? He says, you need to surrender yourself to the divine love of this God, trusting that this God has you. And then Matthew chapter 7, and here's the problem with the big numbers in your Bible. See, the big numbers in your Bible sort of cause some of us, at least, to think that these teachings are happening in isolation, So like Matthew 6 was its thing, and then Matthew 7 happened another day, another time. But you need to understand Matthew 5 through 7 is one series of teachings happening at the same time. And so if you're going to understand what's going in Matthew 7, you've got to understand what's happening in Matthew 6, where Jesus is talking about this, this new way to be human by surrendering yourself. But then in Matthew 7, he swings the conversation from surrendering yourself, he swings the conversation to surrendering others, in particular, surrendering others in your life that very well may be toxic, that very well may not be someone that should be in the most intimate circle of your life because it's bringing about destruction and ruin in your soul. And so Matthew 6 is how do we relate to God. Matthew 7 is how do we relate to others, especially those that are toxic in our lives. And that brings us to the illustration of pearls and pigs. Because what Jesus is helping us understand here through this kind of weird metaphor is that pigs don't appreciate pearls. Right? Like we understand that. That pigs will never appreciate pearls. And so underneath this strange teaching of Jesus, Jesus is teaching us that there are some people in your life that you're going to have to understand they will not appreciate or they will not steward or they will not carry what is most valuable to you. Let's just say, for example, body image. They will not appreciate, steward, or care for that in your life very well. And those people in your life that are toxic, that are destructive, Jesus warns us that if you continue to throw to them what is valuable to you to them, who cannot appreciate it or carry it well, the warning Jesus says is that very well may bring about ruin and destruction in your own life. Now, what does this have to do with health? It's a really good question. I'm so glad you asked that. And to talk about that, to understand what do pearls and pigs have to do with my personal health, we need to talk a little bit about a psychological term that probably most of us in this room have not heard of before. And the term I want to introduce to you today is the term the tripartite model of influence of body image. The tripartite model of influence of body image. Has anybody in here ever heard of the tripartite model of influence of body image? If you have, raise your hand. Okay, like one of you, and that's what I expected, because the only reason you would know this phrase is if you are a psychologist, counselor, a therapist, and you actually went to school for this sort of thing. But just because you don't know that phrase doesn't mean it's not a relevant part of your life. As a matter of fact, the case I want to make over the next few minutes is that the tripartite model of influence of body image has affected each and every one of you in this room, and understanding the tripartite model of influence of body image will actually clarify for you what it will take for you to reclaim health in your life, all right? So this term, the tripartite model of influence of body image, if you Google it, you will likely see an image like the one I'm going to put on the screen right here. If you Google it, you'll see this. Anyone overwhelmed already, right? So let me break down as simple as I can what this is telling us about the tripartite model of influence of body image. The tripartite model of influence suggests that the body ideal that you have, and all of us have one, an image of your body that you think would be the perfect image. You're like, man, if I could just look like that, then I'd be happy, then I'd be healthy, then I'd be satisfied. Body fat percentage, body type, athleticism, all that. It's this body ideal that you have. The tripartite model of influence suggests that you did not come to that conclusion of whatever that ideal is, you did not make that conclusion in isolation. You did not decide for yourself 
what the ideal body image really looks like, but he was influenced by three primary factors. And not only was that influenced by three primary factors, but what you think about your body in comparison to that body image ideal that you have also is not made in isolation. But what you think about your body when you look in the mirror in comparison to the body ideal that you have in your mind, that is also influenced by three primary influencers in your life. And I would encourage you to study this if you're interested, but what the science and psychological community have done is empirically prove that this model right here is how all of us shape our body image ideal and what we think of our body image in light of that ideal. And those three influencers are parents, peers, and media. And I don't know about you, but when I think about this, and I, as I was studying this, I thought, you know what? There's probably no other thing I could think of that influences what I think about myself and what I think about the ideal body image than parents, peers, and media. And so the first is parents. And parents in the room, go ahead and make some noise, parents. Yeah, you sound tired. I get it. Okay. So, so parents in the room, this is so important for you to understand. And if you want to be a parent, At some point in your life, this is so important to understand because one of the primary influences of a person's tripartite body image, uh, a body uh, model of influence of their body image, the primary influence is the parent. It's the things the parent says, it's the things the parent celebrates, it's the things that the parent does either intentionally or unintentionally. It's the things the parents say or do that they didn't think was that big of a deal, but what it was actually doing was shaping a body image ideal in the mind of your child. For example, dad's in the room. When you only talk about your wife and how she looks and how smoking hot she is in front of your kids, then don't be surprised if what you are building in the mind of your kid is an ideal that everything about you that is worth of worth and value is connected to the way you look. Don't be surprised if everything you talk about is how they look or don't look, if they come to the conclusion on their own that I live to be looked at and my worth is connected to other people's approval of my body image. Um, for example, uh, I, I, I think of, of parents that I've heard before, as a youth pastor especially, they would say to their children, they would say, and they're doing this out, out of love, they're not trying to be destructive, but they'll say things like, well, you're never going to get a boyfriend or girlfriend looking like that. And in that moment, what you're doing is planting seeds of what the body image ideal is for them and how their body looks in comparison to that ideal. Are we tracking this morning? I, I think about my oldest sister. And my oldest sister was relentlessly, mercilessly picked on throughout junior high and high school. I'm talking what the sort of things you see in movies where lunch is being poured over her head and she's eating in a corner, hiding from people because of the the real, I would even say, trauma she experienced in high school. And the the, the, the reason that these uh, bullies would say that they're picking on her was because of her weight. And I remember my parents responding to this situation, and they would always tell my sister, the reason they're picking on you is because you're overweight. And they would say, you know, if you lost a little bit of weight, maybe they wouldn't pick on you. And they were trying to help my sister out. They were trying to do what they thought was right in that moment. But in that moment, by reinforcing that the problem was the weight, not that these bullies were just jerks, that not that these, these boys didn't see real beauty, not that it was their problem within them, No, 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 they're picking on you because you're overweight. So if you lose a little bit of weight, you're going to have more friends. This built a construction or an ideal in my sister's head that her worth and her weight were inextricably connected. And so throughout high school, she went on diet after diet. She uh, had an issue with disordered eating. Until eventually she even went to extreme drugs such as meth to just lose weight. To just lose weight. Because deep within her was this idea that her worth and her weight were connected. And if you were to trace it back, much of that would probably be assigned to what my parents said or didn't say to her about her worth. So parents in the room, this is not just a teenage thing to think about. This starts now with your two-year-old, with your one-year-old, with your three-year-old. 
It starts now. Because you are in their tripartite model of influence. But not only are you in their tripartite model of influence of body image via being their parent, but the second influencer is your peers. It's, it's, it's your aunts, your uncles, it's your nieces, your nephews, it's your classmates, it's your, it's your empl- uh, fellow employees, it's, it's your friends, it's your enemy. It's the people that are your peers that surround you, and they say this is the second largest influencer to one's body image ideal, and their comparison of themselves to that ideal is their peers. And I think we understand this, right? I think we understand the power of what our peers can do in our life over a course of time. I think as Benjamin Franklin said, like, you go down with dogs, you rise with fleas, right? I think he understood this idea that, that who's closest to you will rub off on you eventually, right? And so for your peers, this idea is like that moment in junior high school that you asked a boy or girl out and they said no and you were humiliated and you found out later that they said no because they said you weren't attractive enough. And it planted this seed in your mind of, oh, if I look like this, then I would be worthy of that. Or it's that moment in gym class where you take your shirt off and you hear the giggles and the whispers and you're immediately feeling uncomfortable in your own skin. In that moment, seeds begin to be planted. You see, your peers have this influence on your life. And and it's not even just the ones that ridicule you or make fun of you, but it's even the peers, if you're around them, that are just obsessed with living to be looked at. So so they're just obsessed with how they look and how they appear and taking selfie after selfie after selfie after selfie. And and, and their whole thing is like, what do I look like? So the idea here is that even the peers that are with well intentions around you have the ability to influence your body image ideal or feed the body image ideal and what you think you look like in comparison of that. And and the third one is media, is media. Media. Uh, Media is the third influencer in the tripartite model of influence of body image. It's the media you consume. It's the hashtags you follow, the magazines you read, the TV shows you watch. It's the things that you're consuming of media is feeding and reinforcing something. Like, don't be fooled. Um, A salesman's job is to convince you you're not enough. It's to convince you that you're not enough And if you had this product, you would be. If you had this credit card, if you had this body image, if you had this uh, pair of clothing, whatever. If you had this, then you'd be satisfied. Any salesman, it's their job to almost convince you subtly, you're not enough, but if you had this, you would be. And so media literacy is so important, isn't it? Because you're surrounded by ads and marketing and TV shows. They're selling you a product. Media literacy is knowing what's the thing under the thing. Oh, it's, a, it's an ad or a show about uh, uh, health and wellness, but underneath it, it's actually bringing shame and guilt because it's really all about losing weight and not about the whole self that needs to be healthy. It's understanding what is humming under this, and is this healthy for my soul? And it's everywhere. You know that, right? It's everywhere. The Weight Watchers just released an app that is aimed for kids to lose weight. What's under that? Um, you walk throughout the marina, I saw Amy, she posted something this week about it, just signs and sores. And what is it saying? What is it communicating? What's the thing under the thing that might be influencing you? So the tripartite model of body image, of, uh, of, of influence of body image is your parents, it's your peers, and it's your media. And what is so important about this What is so crucial about this is when you understand this model, if you have body image issues, if you don't love the reflection you see in the mirror, you can begin to reverse engineer the problem and go, where are the breakdowns happening? Is the breakdown happening with my parents, my peers, or with media? Is there something that I'm feeding that I need to actually starve? And so for some of you, what this means is you need to start drawing lines with parents that are saying things to you or maybe even saying things to your children that you know are reinforcing a body image ideal that is not healthy or whole. Maybe for some of you, it's your peers. You know, it's the people around you and they're all about living to be looked at. Maybe you need to get some new peers that live to look at others, that live to honor others, that live not to be the center of the story, but live to be a means to somebody else's end instead of reinforcing a body image ideal. Maybe for peers, it's family members that when you go over to their house on Thanksgiving, one of the first things they always say is, hey, looks like you're getting a little bit of a belly. And maybe you just need to say, hey, you know what? I'm more than that. You know, I'm not just a body to be looked at. I'm a person to be loved. 
And perhaps you need to start having hard conversations, or maybe it's as simple as unfollowing a hashtag or canceling a subscription to a magazine. You see, for all of you, I would guarantee if you took control of your parents, peers, and media, and what the ideal they were reinforcing in your life over the next year, I would wager, I would bet that your body image would go to the next level. And so the question the tripartite model of influence brings us to ask is this question, what lines do I need to start drawing? What lines do I need to start drawing? Because if you don't draw lines, what this might mean, if you're not careful, is if you don't draw lines, you may find yourself throwing your pearls to pigs. And now let me pause for a second and say, I don't suggest that like Thanksgiving this year, if you have some family members who are doing things that are saying things and just like step on back, y'all a bunch of pigs, like don't do that. Don't do that. But I am asking the question, how do you start drawing those lines? Because your body image is worth protecting, is it not? Now, here's the important thing, and then we're going to go into an interview in a moment with Amy, is not only do you have a tripartite model of influence, you have that. There's no question about it. But what you also need to know is you are also in somebody else's tripartite model of influence. You not only have a tripartite model of influence, you are in somebody else's. You're in somebody else's as their parent. You're in somebody else's as someone's peer. And we live in an age where we create media every day to be consumed. And the question is, are you a parent that is reinforcing a holistic biblical view of health in others? Are you a peer that is reinforcing a holistic and uh, biblical view of health in others? And does your media, the tweets, the Instagrams, the pictures, the quotes, the, 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 the captions, do they support somebody else's model of influence that you are a part of? See, we're not only responsible for ourselves, but there is a responsibility that we have to others. And so what the tripartite model of influence forces us to ask is, is there any lines I need to draw, but also... Is there any influence that I have that I need to steward better for the sake of others? And I want to talk about what that looks like. Amy, if you could come to the stage, and can we just give Amy some love here real quick? And I've been excited about this. We've been talking about this for a while now of having Amy in this conversation because Amy has been so influential and so helpful to me in unpacking what is far more complex than I thought. Mm -hmm. I'll be honest. Like it's been way harder than I thought because there's so many layers to it. It's been, it's forced me to reevaluate my language and all of that. And so I thought your perspective would be so helpful because you've been in this conversation for a lot longer than I have. It's been a big part of your life. And I would just be interested real quick, how, um, how did you get in this conversation and what, what does the story look like for you? Yeah. So, um, I am a group exercise instructor, and I've been teaching group exercise for about the last 15 years on the side, but um, it's not really that that has brought me into this health conversation. I have struggled with body image for a very, very long time, uh, mainly since the end of high school. And with, it's been within the last like three to four years that I have experienced a lot of growth and healing. And through that growth and healing, I have just wanted to be able to share some of that with other people. So things that I've learned in my process, um, I've just become passionate about sharing with others. Mm -hmm. And I've also become passionate about continuing that growth for myself because it's not something where you like, all of a sudden it goes away. It's something that you have to work on every single day. Um, And also as being a mom of a five-year-old daughter, um, I want to grow and learn for her as well. Yeah, for sure. And so we've been talking about the tripartite model of influence and and learning a lot together about that. And I would just be curious, you know, how has, you know, the tripartite model of influence played out in your body image story as you've navigated that? Yeah, so part of my journey has been reflecting a lot. And I think you brought up a lot of things, good things for people to think about. But I've been able to um, identify, there's been a lot of influences, but I've been able to identify a few that have really impacted me. Um, And the first one that I can remember is in high school, I got a prom dress and it fit, but it was a little bit tight. So I decided I just needed to lose a little bit of weight so that it fit a little bit better. Um, That doesn't seem like that harmful, seems to make sense. But up until that point, food had been no big deal. Like, there was no drama associated. I wasn't analyzing what I was Mm -hmm. eating. And the minute that I had to start restricting or thinking about what I was eating, 
that was the moment where food started to become an issue. Food started to become a source of anxiety instead of just a source of pleasure or fuel. Yeah. Um, and that, I think, really kind of started to kick off disordered eating that has continued for a long time. Mm. Um, the other thing around that time period is you talked about peers. I remember I was about to go off to college, and um, I remember that all I was hearing was about the freshman 15. Has anyone else heard about that little thing? Yeah. I have not. You so have not? You, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I almost went away. I was like, yeah, but no, tell me. You I, don't, okay. I don't know oh what my it gosh. is. Yeah, okay, for those so who don't know. Yeah. For those of you who don't know, <laughs> there is like, uh, when most people go off to college, they have like access to lots of food. And, okay. you know, they may partake in beverages, adult beverages. They may have pizza at midnight. Like water? Like water, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, maybe Gatorade. Um, okay. So sometimes people gain weight when they go to college. Sure. Yeah. But I was hearing about this all the time um, mm. from not just my peers and my age, but adults around me. And so it made me believe, oh, my gosh, the worst thing I could do when I go to college is to gain the freshman 15. Mm. So I told myself, I am not going to gain the freshman 15. In fact, I am going to lose weight. And I didn't need to lose weight. Um, at that point, that first year, um, I put myself on a, a restricted diet that I came up with. Um, and it was not enjoyable, not healthy. So um, I, I think those were two of the, the big catalysts for, in my journey. For sure. And lately, the last couple of years, mm -hmm. this journey has just like snowballed a lot and picked up a lot of steam. So I'd be curious, what catalyzed that for you? What, what has God been doing in your life in this conversation? Yeah, um, the last few years have been pretty amazing. Um, one quote that I have read is that if health or the concept of health creates a problem, then it's not health. Mm. And um, yeah. I was realizing, you know, I've been teaching group exercise and I've been in the health space and I convinced myself that I was being healthy um, I was eating healthfully and those types of things, but I had so many restrictions on myself. Um, it was emotionally exhausting. So I, I don't know what it was exactly. Maybe it was having a child, um, but I just realized that I needed to, I wanted to change. Um, one of the things I did was I went to therapy, and I want to call out that if you go to therapy, you don't have to be diagnosed with anything. Mm. Yeah. You know, I think a lot of people think like, oh, I have to be diagnosed with anxiety or I have to be diagnosed with an official eating disorder. If something is a source of pain in your life and you want someone to help you work through it, go to therapy. Yeah, that's so good. Yeah, that's good. so therapy was a really big one. Um, Travis's Kill the Spider series last year, do we remember that one? It was so good. And you talked about a spider being a lie that you have convinced yourself is true. And even last year, it really touched me because I was still believing that my value and my worth came from how I looked and how small I was. Um, so that encouraged me to not just do therapy, but to also take like an online body love course. I reached out to someone from Canvas that I didn't know very well, but I knew she might have a similar story. And she's been a source of really um, being a really health, healthy peer in my life. So good. So you kind of just reclaimed the tripartite model. You're yeah. like, all right, I'm going to take these three things back. I reclaimed you know? it, yeah. And you mentioned media, too. And um, I brought this magazine, and I only bought it because of this, um, <laughs> because I don't read these magazines anymore. I used to read all of them all the time, but I realized these were not serving me. Um, and so even just on this Women's Health with Kristen Bell, there's like two things on here that caught my eye. And one is the headline is how Kristen Bell got her abs back. Mm. Well, newsflash, she never lost them. Mm. They were all, she, her abs were still there. Yeah, but that's not how it works. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's funny. Yeah. They might not have been visible, but they were always there. Yeah. And so, you know, things like this, like, oh, I need to have a six pack or um, the must do workout moves. Okay, I must do these. Like, there's all this external pressure. So. When even talking media literacy, yeah. this Kristen Bell concept is like, okay, media literacy is going, oh, this feeds mm -hmm. comparison. The entire uh, cell here is comparison. You know, yeah. you could be like Kristen Bell as opposed to saying, you know what, I just want to be Travis, yeah. you know, or Amy and a yeah. really good version of me. I mean, <laughs> Kristen Bell is not like the person I compare to, but <laughs> yeah. Thor is a different conversation. Yeah, so, yeah. but like, yeah, it's, but that, that's what's underneath it. Yeah. yeah. And, there's, and also, like, there's nothing wrong with wanting to have stronger abs because. I mean, they help you with balance. They help you pick up things. They help you get out of your chair. But it's what's that functional element of your body that yeah. it can help you serve or conserve you in your life yeah. and make your life better versus having the visible, like, six-pack. Yeah, for sure. So peers, 
uh, parents and media. Let's talk about that a little bit yeah. because I think it's important we get some handles to like, what does that look like as a parent? What does that look like for you to be a mom to your daughter and, and to kind of lean into this conversation? I'd be curious too how you and your husband have done that um, to really uh, affirm a holistic body image for your her. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the easiest things that parents can do, and even like uncles, cousins, aunts, anyone who's around a child, one of the easiest things you can do is just refrain from talking negatively about your body. Refrain from talking about, if you choose to go on a diet, refrain from talking about a, a diet to your child. Um, you know, I mean, it's simple things like, you know, if I said in front of my daughter, like, oh my gosh, or even if I'm saying this to my husband and I'm like, oh, I just ate half a bag of candy corn, I'm so bad, or I need to go run five mm, miles yeah. because I just ate this. You're, you're um, showing that child, like they internalize everything, so they're gonna say, wait, I like candy corn, or I just had candy corn, like yeah. does that mean I'm bad, mm. or does that mean my body um, is bad too? So really refrain from doing that, but I'd also be cautious about how often you said this, that how often you're praising people for their looks in front of your child as well. It's not to say that you can't ever say someone looks nice or you right. like their outfit, but when your child is hearing compliments, how many of the compliments are looks related? Yeah. You know, like how many, because that was one thing that um, in my tripartite model of influence, I had someone in my life that complimented me a lot on my looks, but didn't compliment some of the other people around me. And I noticed that. I realized, oh, she's, she's judging. I felt pressure to um, continue to look good because I wanted that affirmation. Yeah. So even positive compliments um, can have unintended negative impacts. Well, I think you hit it really well too, is that it really is about balance here. Yeah. It's not to say like, cause I, like, I think my wife is beautiful. Um, I want my daughter to know that I think my wife is beautiful, but I think she's beautiful as a human being on the inside out. She's kind, she's patient, she's amazing. Am I earning enough brownie points in LA? <laughs> uh, like, you know, and I want, I want Finn, my daughter, if you don't know where she is, Finley, to, to see that modeled. And I think that's important. It's, it's about balance. It's like, you say someone looks good, you know? Yeah. Well, and my daughter, I mean, she's five, and she talks about being beautiful. Or, like, if I don't wear this, I'm not beautiful. And it, it does break my heart. Mm. But what I say, I try to say to her, and I don't know if this is right. Like, I'm learning along with the rest of you. But I say to her, I go, you are beyond beautiful. Like, you are beautiful, but you are also kind, and you are so welcoming with so your good. other preschoolers. Yeah. So it's it's um, not being like, no, you're not pretty. You know, you don't want to necessarily say yeah, that, sure. but it's highlighting the other attributes that are really important. Yeah, and we understand, like, looks, it's, it, you see it, it's tangible, right? It's the low-hanging fruit compliment, right? But I think there's something to be, to be said about be the kind of person that sees more mm -hmm. than the skin, <laughs> you know, that sees more than the body type, that sees the whole person not just the, the body, yeah. you know? Yeah. So let's talk about peers, though, um, because that has been a big part uh, for you. Like, what are some helpful ways we can kind of navigate the peer part of the tripartite model of influence to, I mean, it's not like we just kill all our friendships or anything like that. I mean, unless you, you need to. But, yeah. like, I mean, how do you manage that? Yeah, I mean, um, well, when it comes to social media, I have chosen to, um, there's a quote, it's, you're allowed to protect your peace. And I really like that because on social media, I have made decisions that protect my peace. I have chosen to mute people in my life. They're still my friends, but if their content is not serving me um, in a positive way, that. I would also just encourage people to like think about what type of conversation you're bringing to the brunch table. Mm. You know, are you saying things like, oh, I shouldn't be eating this as you're digging into something. Well, why? Like, why shouldn't you be eating it? Is it because someone told you carbs are the devil? Like, mm. you know, like, just think about what type of conversation you're bringing. Yeah. Um, and is it helping people or is it maybe help making them more insecure in their own skin? Mm. Um, and the other thing I would say, too, is kind of going back to the compliments is I don't choose my friends based on how they look. But yet, I would say 95% of compliments that people give to their friends often are based on how they look. Seeing Travis, oh, hey, Travis, I really like your jacket, or you look so great today, Thank blah, you. blah, blah. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> um, but, it's, but it's, again, what are ways that you can greet someone without complimenting them on their looks? So maybe try that this week. This can be a challenge. I'm glad you brought that up. I think it's really good because here's the tension I've had is, and we've talked about it a little bit, but it's like, can I ever say, man, have you lost weight? 
You know what I'm saying? Like, or is that wrong? Is that, should I never say that? Like, when is it right? How do I say it? Like, and maybe it comes back to the balance thing a little bit, but, um, but I, I've struggled with that, kind of going like, is there ever a point where it's appropriate or helpful or healthy to, to acknowledge that and celebrate that? Yeah, so, I mean, to be, I'm not a psychologist. I don't have a degree in any of this, um, so I'm not going to tell you what to do, but I would just throw out some considerations to maybe think about when you are wanting to give that compliment because I understand that the intent is you're wanting to be nice and to be kind. Um, but there's a few things to think about is one, like if you said that to me, I'd be like today, I would be like, well, I mean, I haven't really been trying to lose weight. Mm. Oh, you must have thought I looked bad before. That mm. doesn't make me feel good. Yeah. Um, the other thing is, is that some people lose weight because of illness. Um, I listened to a podcast and there was this woman who had like a horrible case of the flu for a week. And when she got back to work, I mean, so she was losing weight in a very unhealthy manner. And when she went back to work, she was getting compliments on how good she looked. Mm. And she's like, great. Well, next time I start putting carbs in my mouth and can keep them down, oh. I'm going to gain that weight back. Yeah. And you're going to think I look bad. And then the final thing mm. I would just say as a consideration is when you're complimenting someone on weight that they've lost, you don't know how they achieved that weight loss. And you could be fueling something that's very unhealthy. Mm. And I have experienced that um, where I was complimented on weight loss, but the people don't know that I was in an emotional hell doing it. Yeah. Um, so it's maybe think of some a different way to acknowledge yeah. the work they've done. If you've seen on Instagram that they've been running a little bit or training for a 5K, say, hey, like I've seen that you're running. That's really cool. How's it going? Yeah. Acknowledge good. their behaviors um, versus an outcome. That's really good. That's really helpful because I, I think there are a lot of well-intentioned people, yeah, right? They're absolutely. just trying to pay a compliment, but they're not thinking about the thing under the thing, you know, and what that might be saying to that person receiving that, what that might be affirming, and maybe that's not healthy. And so it's it's seeing more. Yeah. That's good. That's yeah. really good. Last question on this, and I think this question is too important to pass up, but self-improvement and self-acceptance. Mm -hmm. Can self-improvement and self-acceptance coexist? Yeah, so I mean, I think when people think of self-acceptance, sometimes they associate it with complacency. Like, mm -hmm. okay, if I accept myself, then I just don't have to do anything. Um, and really, I think it's a little bit more about self-compassion. Mm -hmm. So it's looking at yourself and acknowledging, you know, I'm not perfect. There are things that could be improved about me. But at this moment, I am still good. I am still valuable. I am still worthy. Because if we're always can looking for um, something else to be the thing that affirms us, we're always going to be searching. Because yeah. once you lose that 10 pounds, um, you know, maybe you've noticed you've got some crow's feet around your eyes. And then you're going to have to go get that. And, like, mm -hmm. it's just going to be never ending. Yeah. So it's not to say that, um, I mean, growth is a part of the human condition. And it's a great thing. But if you can be compassionate with yourself and remind yourself that you're worthy, um, you're not going to be dependent on that growth for that worth. Yeah, it's kind of like what's driving what, you yeah. know? Is self-improvement driving the hope for self-acceptance or is self-acceptance yeah. kind of driving self-improvement? That like, hey, I'm I'm doing this from health, not for health. Yeah, I'm doing exactly. this from satisfaction, not for satisfaction. So it's kind of going like, hey, before you talk self-improvement, let's talk self-acceptance. Yeah. You yeah. know, where are you with the real you inside of you? Are you are you okay? Yeah. You know, and because it's not wrong to go on a diet or or work out or anything like there's like, but like there is something unhealthy about it if you're doing it with this idea of like when I do this and I hit this goal I'm gonna be accepted finally yeah you know? I think if um you need like a little Pinterest quote or something you can take home it can be um it's not the what that matters but the why yeah, so good so it's not you know if you are putting on for I know this goes to women but if you're putting on a full face of makeup like that's not necessarily wrong like putting on makeup's not wrong yeah. but are you putting it on because you are trying to mask yourself you're afraid of being judged if you don't have makeup on at the grocery store or something like that yeah. or are you doing it because it's creative self-expression or you just like it yeah so it's not the what that you're doing but it's the why yeah so good and I think that's the perfect note to end on can we give it up to Amy and show some love to her thank you Amy thank you and if the band wants to come up, we're going to wrap this up. And I, I, I skipped this verse earlier, and I was wrestling with whether I go back to it. But um, maybe we go a minute longer, but I'm going to say it anyways, because I think this verse is so good. Psalm 101, 6, 6 through 8, David, he writes this. He says, I will search for faithful people to be my companions. 
Only those who are above reproach will be allowed to serve me. I will not allow deceivers to serve in my house, and liars will not stay in my presence. My daily task will be to ferret out the wicked and free the city of the Lord from the grip. Now, now understand, is David writing about body image when he wrote this? Probably not. But I think the principle that David writes about transcends the conversation and translates in this one pretty well. That if you're going to protect your health and your body image, that you're going to need to be intentional about who's in your house. And I'm not talking about your literal house. So if you think I'm talking about your apartment, catch up. I'm talking about your heart. I'm talking about the real you inside of you and the peers, parents, and media that influence you, the lines you have. Like what David says is, look, I'm going to protect this house. And I'm going to take anybody that doesn't tell me the truth, I'm getting rid of that. So if there's anyone or anything that's telling you a lie about you, it is within your power to remove them and replace them with people who will tell you the truth about you. Who's in your house? Who's in your house? Who's at the dinner table of your heart right now? The most intimate place of influence in your heart. And are they feeding a healthy body image, a healthy posture? And if not, what lines do you need to draw? But let me remind you that you are not only in a tripartite model of influence, you are in somebody else's tripartite model of influence. So how can you be a steward of that influence that speaks truth, not lies to people? When somebody says, oh, I, I shouldn't eat this, I've put on so much weight, that we pause that person and say, hey, I just want you to know you are so much more than your weight. You are worth so much more. God loves you for who you are, and your worth and your weight have nothing to do with each other. Are you willing to be that kind of person? Are you going to be the kind of person that talks about body first and personhood second, or could we be the kind of community that sees people and sees personhood before we see anything else in anybody else? And so I want to go to Hebrews chapter, uh, I'm sorry, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, the message translation, I think it lands the plane perfectly. It says this, so let's do it, full of belief, confident that we're presentable inside and out. I love that line. Let's move forward, confident that we're presentable inside and out. That is the baseline of this series, that because of Jesus, because of the cross, because of God's love, you are worthy, you have identity, you are presentable from the inside out. It's starting from this place of self-acceptance. And then he says, let's keep a firm grip on the promises that keep us going. He always keeps his words. Let's see how inventive we can be in encouraging love and helping out. Not avoiding worshiping together as some do, but spurring each other on, especially as we see the big day approaching. I think this is the best way to land this series. How do we move forward into a positive, holistic, biblical place of health, not only individually, but collectively? First is this. We've got to hold on to the promises of God for our lives. We've got to hold on to the realities of who we are in Christ over our lives. Who are you? You are a person to be loved, not a body to be looked at. You are a multifaceted person. Do not reduce yourself to a body part because you are so much more. You are made, as Genesis 1 says, in the image of God. Before you were you, God knew you. Before you were you, God loved you. And even if you do nothing, God sees you as valuable. Those are the promises and the realities that we stand on as human beings in light of the love of Christ. But we don't let it end there. How do we move into a place of health collectively? Like the author of Hebrews says, he says, let's see how inventive we can be in encouraging love and helping out. I want us to be a church that's innovative. We're always like, how can I love someone today? How can I encourage someone today? That we're being innovators of encouragement and love for others, spurring each other on, as the author of Hebrews says. Because when the, the author says the big day is coming, what's underneath that is the author is saying it's not going to get easier. That the world isn't going to get cleaner or easier or more linear. The world and its battles are going to rage on, and that means we not only need God, but if we're going to make it, we need each other. Can I get an amen? I not only need God, I need you. You not only need God, you need me. You need the person on your left and on your right and in front of you and behind you. And one of the healthiest things you can do for your life is to get healthy people around you. Because your worth, your health, your body image, 
It's too valuable of a thing just to be thrown around to anybody anywhere. And so may we be a church that not only is healthy individually, but may we be a church that fights for the health of our brothers and sisters. May we be the church that doesn't live as individuals standing in front of a mirror, but may we be a church of people who become a mirror that reflect the hope and love and grace and worthiness to every human being that we come in contact with. Because if love is the medicine our soul needs, then Canvas, we should be the pharmacy. We should be the pharmacy that people come into and experience the love that their souls need. And I'll end on this. How does the gospel relate to this conversation of health? How does the gospel even relate to the conversation of a tripartite model of influence and body image? Friends, let me remind you, the gospel declares that God became our parent, that Jesus came to earth and became our peer, and the empty tomb is our story to consume and build our lives off of. The gospel is that God reclaimed, restored, renewed the tripartite model of influence so that God and Jesus and the resurrection would be the baseline of your life and your identity and your future. And so may we be healthy. May we be people who fight for the health of others because the story of the empty tomb says all things are being made new and all things are worthy of love. Because God, our Father, and Jesus, our peer, he won the battle on our behalf on that cross.